Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. All right. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Welcome to the Maryland Public Service Commission. Uh, we will come to order for our administrative meeting on September 14th, 2022. Apologize for the, the slight delay this morning. Um, as I mentioned last week, the commission continues to have uh, wonderful opportunities for uh, career advancement. And I'd just like to make a plug for one of our positions in the telecommunications gas and water division. We're currently looking for an assistant director to assist uh, Benjamin Baker and his team upstairs in TGW. That job is posted and will be open until the 23rd of, of this month. We do have meeting minutes to approve from our last meeting on September 7, 2022. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. The meeting minutes are approved. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, uh, before we begin, we're going to defer item three, the first item on the administrative agenda, to a later date. We've got two items on the consent agenda this morning. Item one is State Farm Fire and Casualty Company filed its bond cancellation for Premier Consulting, Inc. And item two is Inertia Energy Advisors, LLC, filed an application for a license to supply natural gas services in Maryland. Thank you. Seeing no questions, I would move that with respect to item number one, that we cancel the company's electricity supplier license, and with respect to item number two, that we grant the company a license to operate as a natural gas supplier in Maryland, limited to broker services for the customer classes and service territories applied for and recommended by staff, direct the company to provide marketing and training materials specific to its Maryland operations to the commission staff 30 days prior to utilization of the materials in Maryland, and direct the company to file notice with the commission within 30 days of any changes to the information in the application. The vote begins with Commissioner Linton. All right. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. And Commissioner Richard. Aye. I vote aye. The motions are approved. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to call items four and five collectively together. They're filings from Car Properties Partnership LP. They're applications for approval to use an energy allocation systems systems at the Elm uh, 4710 Elm Street in Bethesda. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Spiegelman. And if we have counsel for car properties, please approach. Mr. Spiegelman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Michael Spiegelman on behalf of staff. This item concerns two requests filed on February 23rd, 2022 and March 23rd, 2022 by Car Properties Partnership LP to install two energy allocation systems. One, a domestic hot water uh, system and second, an uh, HVAC system. The systems are for 456 unit apartment building located at uh, 4710 Elm Street, Bethesda, Maryland. Public Utility Article Section 7-304B2 states that an energy allocation system may not be used for direct billing of energy costs to a tenant of individual dwelling unit unless the Commission approves the system in accordance with uh, this subsection. Commerce 2026 further specifies general approval criteria for energy allocation, allocation system, namely, one, approval may be granted upon demonstration by the owner that the system results in reasonable de determination of the cost of energy used within the dwelling unit. Two, test testing and inspection of the energy allocation, allocation system may be required for commission to make such a determination. And three, testing and inspection of any furnace appliance or other equipment used in conjunction with energy allocation system may be also required. Car Properties Partnership LP has contracted with Conservice LLC for the installation of energy allocation systems that will allow uh, the owner of the apartment building to allocate to a tenant of individual dwelling a portion of the cost of gas and electric energy consume, consumed based on the usage. Car Properties uh, Partnership initial application contained all information required under Commerce 2026 and subsequent uh, data request responses uh, have given staff no causes or concerns in regards to the system themselves. The apartment building's construction is complete and use of energy allocation system would comply with requirements under relevant former provisions. Therefore, staff recommends that the commission approve the energy allocation systems for the uh, Elm Street apartment building located in Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spiegelman. For both buck sheets, uh, are there any questions? Seeing none, I would move that with respect to items number four and number five that we approve the allocation, approve the applications for the energy allocation systems at the Elm Apartments in Bethesda, Maryland. The vote begins with Commissioner Linton. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. And Commissioner Richard. Aye. I vote aye. The motion is approved. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think we're going to call items six through nine collectively together. Thank you. And if, if uh, utilities and representatives for items six through nine can make their way to the table, uh, one seat per uh, party. Mr. Chairman, items six through nine are filings from the Potomac Edison Company, the uh, Potomac Electric Power Company and Delmarva Power and Lake Company, Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative, Inc., and the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company. They're all filings of their respective semi-annual EV pilot program progress report for the first half of 2022. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. McAuliffe. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Drew McAuliffe on behalf of staff. Don't have any prepared uh, comments today uh, on the various reports. Just one uh, point of clarification for Potomac Edison's report. Um, they did request that uh, their Myersville park and ride location be extended to match up with their uh, battery storage pilot. Um, we've done this similarly with the uh, Urbana project that had to be canceled, uh, I believe, a couple months ago. So just to clarify, staff has no concerns with extending um, the EV pilot period for that specific location to match up with the battery storage pilot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council for Potomac Edison. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. If you could uh, just take the podium and uh, state your name and title, please. Good morning. It's uh, Greg Waterworth, staff for Potomac Edison. We appreciate staff's uh, recommendations and comments, especially concerning uh, the Meyerson. And if 
the commission has any uh, questions, uh, we have staff here ready to answer. Okay. Um, do, you, do you need a... I'll ask Mr. McCall, you, you hang out right there for a moment, please. Do you need a vote of the commission to align the two dates? Or? I, I believe so, since it was a change to the program. Okay. And, and what is the new the new date? Uh, it's December 31st, 2026, December 30th. to match okay. up with the storage pilot uh, period. Okay. Does, does any commissioner have an objection to aligning the dates? Seeing no objection, that request is approved. Mr. McAuliffe, how did we want to handle the, the other items, 7, 8, and 9? Did you have any prepared remarks for these other items? Uh, no, I do not. I, okay. I'd be happy to discuss them. Thank you. Thank you. Overall, um, I see the utilities, all five utilities, trending in the, the right direction. We see increased usage year over year, quarter over quarter. I think quarter is probably the, the smallest component of time I saw with respect to at least charge point. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes. From uh, uh, Potomac Edison. Thank you. We see some chargers now actually in the black, which is is terrific. Not many. I don't think we expected um, most of the char chargers to be turning a profit this early on. Um, but before I go too far with with remarks, we'll we'll hear from the other utilities um, if they have any comments or wish to address the commission. So we'll turn to. Item number seven, which is um, uh, Pepco and Delmarva. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Taylor Beckham here on behalf of Potomac or Pepco Holdings. Um, I have with me today Brianne Jordan, our Senior Manager, Smart Grid Innovation, Smart Grid and Innovation. Neil Baker, our Senior Manager, Project Management. Matt Bowen, our Senior Manager of Reliability Programs, and Stephen Park, our Manager of Project Execution, to take any questions. One item I just want to clarify, um, as to OPC's comments regarding our um, education and outreach uh, budget increase request, we're not sure if it's actually saying exactly what we requested. Uh, PHI requested um, the allocation to the um, managed residential charger program for DPL and the multifamily program and the manager charge rebate for both utilities. And I think that's what OPC is saying, but um, that is just one thing that I just wanted to call your attention. I see Mr. Hoover nodding his head in, yeah. is that agreement? That, that's agreement. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. All Perfect. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, next here from, uh, what we'll do is we'll hear from all the utilities and then the commissioners will may have questions. We'll hear from SMECO. Uh, good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Jeff Shaw on behalf of SMECO here today just to answer any questions should you have any. Thank you. I think we, we may. Um, uh, Baltimore Gas Electric. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. Brent Palea on behalf of BGE. I uh, want to thank the stakeholders, OPC and Mr. Hartman and staff for their comments uh, and recommendations. Uh, we're here. I have a whole fleet of BGE, no pun intended, uh, uh, <laughs> folks who are ready and able to answer any questions you may have. Uh, we have a couple of requests, as you know, that we made in the semi-annual report, um, and so we're looking for a, a favorable vote on, on those two requests. Uh, and uh, like I said, we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. We've now heard from all the utilities. We did have some interveners. Um, do we have Montgomery County present? No, we, but we do have Ms. Brennan's um, uh, comments on record. Um, okay, at this point, we'll hear from OPC, Mr. Hoover. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, Fred Hoover on behalf of the Office of People's Council. We filed uh, a letter commenting on certain aspects related to PHI and BG&E's uh, request, mainly related to this uh, proposed increases in the consumer uh, or in the outreach and education budget. Uh, we've had ongoing concerns about this area becoming almost like a black box that money just seems to go into. Uh, and we asked some questions regarding that, and we still have some concerns about some of the controls over how the money is being allocated to the various programs. But in reviewing uh, staff's comments, both with when it comes to PHI and the BG&E, uh, we support the, the recommendations that staff made. So in regarding PEPCO, the allocations that they want to make on the consumer education budget we're actually comfortable with now, but we do support staff's specific recommendations when it comes to the BG&E money. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. Let, let me ask um, both PHI and probably a little more um, 
importantly, BGE, how they respond to staff's recommendation. OPC s supports it entirely. Uh, what say the Exelon utilities? We support staff's recommendations. I'll defer to BGE. PHI does. PHI does. I think uh, what BGE's preferred option is the option that we we, we uh, excuse me we, we requested uh, in our filing. If the commission prefers a, a narrowed scope, uh, we can adapt to accommodate that. Uh, but we do think the best approach is what we did propose. Okay. Thank, thank you. I, I see some head nodding in the audience from, from maybe some of your compatriots. Uh, anybody else is free to approach a podium if, if you wish to speak. Um, all right. A as I said a moment ago, I see positive movement with respect to all of our utilities and their, um, their pilot programs. We're now cl f quickly approaching the end of year four, and we have uh, one year left to, to go. Um, Obviously, this was the five-year program was somewhat interrupted by, by COVID and supply chain issues, which has, to no fault of, of anybody here, slowed down the rollout. Uh, the area of most interest to me is the, the public charging uh, portfolios that all of these utilities, all of your utilities now have. And I'm just happy to see that so many chargers uh, are now entering the, the black. I was chatting with Commissioner O'Donnell this morning, um, the Capitol Clubhouse, the uh, Protuxent Naval Air Station Museum. They're doing very, very well. So I would just remind the utilities that um, location, location, location is important. Finding the right real estate on which to site your uh, charging equipment is really essential if the utilities are effectively placing chargers in locations that nobody will ever use. And, and you have the data. You know which ones are rarely touched and which ones have lines out the door. Uh, for instance, uh, DPL's Salisbury University charges, I think, are those the highest in, in your in your fleet? Highest so charge us usage? Let me defer to, yes, that is. Yes, correct. they are. I know, because I had to wait for one recently. Uh, <laughs> and there were some, some problems with the charger, not fatal. I, I was still able to get a charge, but I, I let DPL uh, aware of that. And of course, those chargers that have lines, they're going to have more wear and tear, more usage, They'll likely need more maintenance than the ones that are just sitting idle. Although, as we all know, things that sit idle probably also need more regular maintenance as, um, as well. I, I neglected one intervener that I have listed here. Um, we had Mr. A, a private citizen, Mr. Lanny Hartman, responded to the BGE uh, report. Mr. Hartman, are you here with us today? Ah. Is there anybody else I neglected to recognize in the audience? No. Okay. Mr. Hartman, we have your detailed. I, I dare say it was a, a, a report. Um, so I'll cede the floor to you. Good morning, Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Uh, Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Lanny Hartman. I'm uh, an EV driver and a BGE rate payer. And I'm here in case you have any questions on my written comments. Okay. Well, you, you, your comments were substantial. The methodology that you use to conduct your investigation, uh, driving to 69 chargers, was it? Yes, sir, 69 at uh, uh, I think 39 different locations. Every yeah. single uh, charger, fast charger in the BGE territory. Mr. Balea, is he on your payroll? <laughs> I, saw, I was joking with some folks internally that maybe we should uh, you know, offer that. <laughs> he, he, he probably should be. It was, it was um, I, I appreciate the, the the time, the effort, the thoughtfulness, the statistics that you provided. I trust BGE has carefully reviewed the report you have. Yeah, we've, we appreciate the report too and the work, uh, you know, all kidding aside. And we've, we take, I think, reliability of the chargers very seriously. And um, we have uh, looked through the report and uh, we're happy to meet uh, with Mr. Hartman at any time to to learn more about uh, what he found. We, we were not able to get, we're not sure whether there might have been an attachment to the report uh, that was intended to have been filed that identified which stations he was actually at or which ones he found to be malfunctioning. But what, was, was there an attachment that we're missing? We have seven pages, I believe. Right. Uh, no, there's, there was not an attachment. I did not include the specific uh, chargers in their condition. I didn't match to it. And uh, I have that information, of course. Okay. Well, M Mr. Balea and Mr. Hartman, um, it would probably be good if you 
two of you had a conversation, you could use the conference room behind the receptionist at the end of today's hearing just to get on the, on the same page there. But as a fellow EV driver, I oftentimes wonder if this, these 99% uh, uptime ratings are actually accurate because I've been to three chargers on one drive and, and two of them are um, suffering some type of deficiency. So um, I, I see and understand your point and I appreciate you representing effectively the EV uh, driving public in the BGE territory. Um, so please, please continue to, to keep the utility on its toes. Uh, do my colleagues have questions? Commissioner O'Donnell. Uh, yeah, Ms. McCullough, does staff receive uh, detailed um, information on specifically where every dollar of these education and outreach um, uh, efforts go? Uh, so we, we did have working group meetings to try and get more into that. Um, I believe BGE and the PHI companies did provide uh, more detail than we typically get with, you know, uh, tables in their reports breaking it down somewhat. I, I believe the PHI utilities even broke it down by, uh, you know, kind of residential versus non-residential customers. So yes and no, um, you know, through DRs and things like that, we try to get more specific. I, and I'll say that they have been more specific than previous reports. Yeah, when you say more than we normally get, it doesn't sound like you're getting anything. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, to be fair, I don't know that we dug to the very specifics in the beginning. Now that we've kind of had the program, we've already had education and outreach, we are trying to dig down to, like, you know, to understand what more do you need to do or, you know, what benefits are we getting from these extra dollars. And I think Mr. Hoover makes a good point in, in that these are areas that are not concrete. They're not physical installations. They're, they're kind of nebulous, and they can be an area to move monies around. And we got requests here this morning to move monies around. And that's just a little concerning to me. Do the utilities have a comment with regard to the Exelon utilities or SMECO or, or a, a Potomac Edison have um, commentary with regard to providing more granular information with education and outreach spends? Yes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Stephanie Leach for Baltimore Gas and Electric Company. I can answer some of your questions related to the customer education and outreach budget. For for BGE, our, uh, our the agency that we work with, who the creative agency that does all of our graphic design, creative copywriting, they, they charge us by the hour uh, for each person who works on the material. They might be working on a flyer for our residential program, uh, a multifamily web page, um, all within a certain day, and they charge us for all the work that they did within that day. So in order to break down by program would be extremely difficult. Uh, we could try to you know, get them to do that work um, moving forward, but retroactively it would be extremely difficult for us to break out that work. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, I'd like to hear from the other utilities as well, but I'm wondering how much of these monies go to, for lack of a better term, tchotchkes, if you will, to hand out at conferences and forums and other kind of foo-foo efforts. I can tell you for BG, a very nominal amount has been spent on any sort of giveaways. We prioritize direct communication with our customers through direct email, through community events and through uh, online education and outreach to our customers, things that are measurable. Um, and we've tried to include in the semi-annual report and all of our filings, those measurable results so you can see the direct engagement that we've had with our customers. Ms. Taylor. I'm gonna yield the floor to Brian Jordan. If I may, uh, Commissioner O'Donnell, I did notice on page 13 of the BGE semi-annual report, there's a line item called event and outreach materials, which represents 1% of the budget. I don't know if that's tchotchkes, but it sounds like it to me, so. Fair enough, we even do some of that ourselves when we're advertising our choice, customer choice programs. I'm not trying to be too pejorative against that stuff. I just like to know, get a sense of what's going on out there. Go ahead. Thank you, Commissioners. Brianne Jordan, Senior Manager of Smart Grid and Innovation for PHI. 
uh, similar to, to BGE's methodology, we do leverage uh, the assistance of an external vendor with uh, on staff through a rate card fund uh, or rate cards, uh, copywriters, media buyers, graphic designers, and such that would be providing the, uh, the staffing around the various programs. Um, and similarly, we would retroactively um, have a challenge around breaking it out. Um, and similarly to the to BGE, our our buys of tchotchkes and such, we're actually still working through um, you know I initial tchotchkes from um, early in the program that we had around a, a heavy focus on external outreach and education, uh, where we were advertising the programs heavily through um, low cost hand to hand contact, uh, which really came to a, a halt during the COVID times as well. So um, we have we do have very little um, direct uh, tchotchkes and purchases, but the um, you know moving forward with the marketing strategy that we were proposing in our semi-annual report, I do believe there is an opportunity that we could account for um, in a different manner, in, in a more clar clarified manner, uh, an opportunity uh, to, to capture the specific programs. Thank you, Michael. From the SMECO perspective, we're slightly different because we're all in just for public charging network at this time. So all that money spent is for the public program that we operate. We probably could do a better job of breaking it down underneath of that marketing and education. I'll take a look at the uh, reports from BG&E and from PEPCO to see their way that they're teasing it out. And maybe we could do a better job of breaking down the overall budget that we are spending for marketing. I appreciate the uh, willingness to take a look at how that's reported to make sure that there's no concerns out there amongst the advocates. Um, I, I will also note while SMECO's up at the table that, um, Mr. Chairman, I, the, the ex relative explosion of EVs in the Southern Maryland region is, is, is astonishing to me. I see it every day. And I didn't know we had so many Tesla buyers down there, but they're they're everywhere because they're so noticeable. But there are many other electric vehicles, and so it's um, I'm I'm not surprised to see some of those stations being used very heavily. Um, you know, we have high per capita dri uh, income drivers at Tuxen River Naval Air Station, at the nuclear power plant, at the gas plant, and in many other locations, and uh, and that allows a lot of electric vehicles to to uh, be adopted and it's one of the reasons why I've been pushing so hard for making sure that the, this infrastructure gets distributed to the rural areas of the state as well because I think that's essential for the success and adoption like it's happening in Southern Maryland. Um, do you have a station at um, at the Aquatic Center in Prince Frederick? Do I remember that one or no? Very, very soon. Soon. Okay. I believe that one is close to being done. I'm going to turn around for a quick second and get a nod for that one. Here, Here you go. Yeah, it's already, there's a uh, construction schedule date of end of September, early October to get started. The answer is uh, there's a construction date uh, early October, end of September to get started. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say that into yep, the yep. microphone. Yep. Um, okay, very good. Um, and how's the one at the Marine Museum going? Uh, being used, uh, it's going well. I had reservations with concerts that would on go at the facility, um, but we go out and take a look at things after concerts to make sure everything's still in one piece and yeah. doing doing okay. Well, you get a Beach Boys Four Tops Temptations concert, then you're not going to have a whole lot of damage. Everybody's too old. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And and uh, 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 P. Uh, good morning, Neil Keating here for Potomac Edison. Um, I think uh, our education and outreach mirrors what other folks, other utilities have said. I will call out uh, Appendix B on page 44 of our filing. We do break out the costs by residential, non-residential, and uh, uh, other programs. So there is some granularity we provide there. Uh, and then with the work group, we did provide some more granularity as to what uh, individual items were within those buckets. Um, most of our I'll say event materials. Uh, costs were incurred early in the program, and then we've been using those event materials at other events. So uh, recently, costs have been around direct response, uh, getting people uh, via email or direct mail, and also events and event sponsorships. Very good. Thank you. 
All right. Um, I, I think that answers all my questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Richard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I also want to just join you in uh, recognizing uh, that there's uh, encouraging trends that we're seeing in the state and uh, hoping that we can continue to see uh, that kind of progress. I, I did also want to just uh, you know, emphasize some of the points I think uh, Commissioner O'Donnell was making about the, uh, the advertising and the education and that type of budget. Um, given that this is a pilot, uh, I think it's very important that we do have the kind of granular data uh, necessary to, 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 to at the, so that at the end of the pilot, we know what's working, what's what's uh, resonating with residents, uh, and you know if they're tchotchkes, if, if that's actually helping uh, to, to, to support the cause. So, um, I, I would really like to encourage the utilities to please provide OPC and staff with the data, the granular data that they're they're requesting. Um, I also want to just ask uh, you know, staff. Uh, do we have any kind of benchmarking data? Because again, I, I think we are seeing very encouraging trends with uh, usage and and uh, the availability, operation of the, uh, the the facilities. But just as far as when we're looking at the uh, the utility-owned infrastructure, how, how does it compare overall with uh, the infrastructure of the you know EVGO, Electrify America, PlugShare, those types of things? Are are, are we operating at least on par? Uh, as far as uh, functionality of these uh, these facilities, and uh, are we seeing utilization rates? You know, sure. um, you know what we 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 do not have a benchmark. That's actually a great question. Um, Typic we have asked for usage data with other kind of EV uh, rates and things like that from the Teslas and and EVGOs and other folks, and they they can be a little hesitant to give out that kind of data. Um, you know, it's you know just for their general business practices. They don't like to hand out that data. Um, but sure, yeah, I, I, that's a great question. I, we can look into that to see if other, uh, you know, utility-owned chargers, how their uh, usage and, and reliability is. And uh, we can look into to finding some data on the uh, private marketplace as well. But unfortunately, no, I, I, I don't have a good um, idea on that. I mean, I would, I would say I'm sure the Tesla chargers in general are probably used the most around the country. Um, so that may not be the, the best benchmark to use, but uh, no, we can look into that. Okay, yeah, I think that would be appreciated. And um, again, since a lot of these uh, you know, enter enterprises like Bugshare, Evigo, they're, they're partners, I, I would hope that uh, since they advocated their partnership and the, uh, the, the involvement of the utilities, that they will be helpful and forthcoming with this kind of data so that uh, at the end of the pilot, we, we know whether or not this is, uh, is working and this is a good model. Uh, or not, and, and, and also just the, uh, the the functioning rate, the operational rate, as the chairman pointed out. Uh, location is important. The good thing about having an EV is for the most part, you can always charge it at the workplace or at home. But when you need a charger, you got to have a charger, <laughs> and it's got to be where you're traveling. So um, it is very important, uh, I think, as a, as a driver, a, a new, new, relatively new driver of an EV, that uh, if we're going to, if we're going to, uh, subsidize this with uh, with uh, ratepayer money that we make sure that the chargers are working and that they're where they're needed. So thank you again for thank yep. you to the utilities for these reports. And, thank and you, just Mr. Th thank you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, it, we do have that reliability working group up and going. You know, we've we've been trying to work on those metrics to to give a more accurate picture of reliability as well. So that is something we've been looking at over the summer. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Linton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to everyone. I, I echo my colleagues' uh, comments uh, regarding the uh, success uh, to this point of the pilot and uh, the, the interest, the growing interest in using uh, not only the uh, chargers but uh, all of the other uh, portions of the pilot uh, that are being used by customers all around the state. Uh, I think those are all positive things. Uh, so I'm uh, keeping in mind that this is a pilot. I did have a couple of questions. Uh, and since we're talking to all of the utilities, uh, it kind of works out nicely because you're all here. Um, one of the, uh, and I've asked this question before, uh, one of the uh, uh, components of the pilot uh, was to make sure that we, we were initiating this and using ratepayer money uh, because we wanted to inspire investment from other charging companies in Maryland. Uh, because we knew from the very beginning that uh, we weren't going to produce uh, enough chargers uh, just using ratepayer money uh, to satisfy what we projected to be the eventual demand 
uh, on those chargers uh, and in our state. Uh, and that projection was from a couple of years ago. So we know now that many new companies are coming out with uh, vehicles. A lot of our old, some of the companies that have produced cars for a long time are coming out with vehicles uh, within the next couple of years. So I'm curious, uh, have number one, and this is for the utilities first, uh, have you, uh, what, what type of pro programs and efforts have you been making uh, to encourage uh, more make ready uh, s charging uh, availability for companies that are interested in coming to Maryland uh, and perhaps are uh, hesitant for some reason or perhaps finding it difficult to do so. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Christy fleischmann Gronke with BGE. Um, as far as make ready, uh, we have a proposal in the, the fleet program that I think is heard later on today's agenda that, that has a make ready component. I think another important piece that we've heard from the private charging companies is an EV rate. And that's currently going through the EV uh, work group with Ms. Amanda Best to develop an EV specific rate. That seems like it's very important to the private charging companies to make their stations profitable is understanding the impacts of demand charges on the rates that they're paying uh, from their electricity consumption. We believe make ready is, is important. Um, and have seen that come up as, as a way of allowing more investment into the state. Um, so I think that's something we've learned over the past few years and, and perhaps if you know we're able to continue programs into the future that Make Ready should be a big focus of um, what future programs might look like. Okay, All right, so many other companies? Thank you, hi, Brianne Jordan again. Um, PHI utilities uh, are similarly to, to BGE, uh, also in evaluating opportunities within the NEVI funding um, and partnering through um, the uh, utility contribution, you know, looking at the LMI opportunities um, and what the utility space can, can also do to uh, entice the contributions um, to really have a chance to to succeed in in spreading that uh, adoption. Um, we are also participating in the fleet proposal as well, and we currently have rate uh, the EV only time of use rate for for PHI. Um, outside of the, the not to speak uh, fully about our other programs, but we do also model the make ready programs within the our Atlantic City Electric area as well as the the district. So this is uh, certainly a strategy that PHI is interested in pursuing and uh, looking to see how we can advance Make Ready within the state of Maryland as well. From a SMECO perspective, we're really taking them as they come to us and, and really apply for a new service connection. So there hasn't been a lot in the world of fleet. There's one that comes to mind. Uh, from a fleet perspective, um, the Teslas of the world do and have been coming through and, and making connections at lots of the uh, local Wawa's is where they tend to be putting them. They'll put a whole bank of chargers there at the grocery stores. Um, so we'll just take those as they come. Uh, for Potomac Edison, um, we uh, participated in the work groups. Uh, one of the work groups included discussion around Make Ready uh, and then the fleet work group. And we are investigating uh, ways to uh, assist with uh, the NEVI funding that's coming out. Okay, so are there efforts to, uh, just piggybacking a bit on, the, on, on some of the comments the chairman made earlier, uh, location is, is a very important. Uh, but there are some locations in the state where it may not today seem like a good place to place a charger. Uh, some of the inner city urban areas, some of the rural areas, for example. Uh, but uh, people there, of course, are going to need them too. So uh, in terms of working today and looking today, looking forward uh, to see uh, what needs to be done in the future, again, this is a, we're talking a short period of time here uh, before these vehicles are suddenly available uh, and consumers can start going to the lot, buying them, hopefully not having the experience I had when I first got my electric vehicle, um, where it was plugged in the wall and I was told that it was being charged. 
Uh, so I was on an L1 charger for about three hours. So I had about 10 miles of range. Uh, so I didn't get too far right away. But, uh, suffice to say, I got where I had to go. But um, I would not like others to have that similar experience. So uh, is there a strategy or thinking in place uh, to look at areas where today it may not seem as though that's a good spot to put a charger, but uh, four or five years from now, it could be a good spot? From a SMECO perspective in the rural part is what I could speak to. That's a yes where we have that public area available to us. We have some that we've installed today that we see very uh, low utilization rates. Uh, we know it. But we're hoping, as you indicated, as the vehicles come, that those stations will be there at the ready for them when, when they need them. So we have done a few of those. Okay. Yes, PHI has, uh, we have taken the opportunity to think about site location, 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 location. And we have uh, been able to install chargers in every one of the counties within our jurisdiction. And so it, ensuring that we are focused on not, even though utilization is a critical piece of this, but understanding that the, um, the evolution of the, the charging geography needs to be spread about the territories is really critical to our siting as well. So early in our, um, in our installations, it was noted that we were perhaps a little slower in our, the installations. We did spend a significant amount of time on siting and uh, bringing it, the equity piece into the conversation as well. So um, major effort underway to ensure that we are continuing the diversification of our geography. And for BGE, I'd echo Brianne's comments. Um, we are spreading the chargers around our service territory. We have them in all of our counties and ensure that we put chargers where there aren't any nearby. Um, seeing a lot of great usage in those you know, communities out in the rural areas of BGE service territory. Uh, I'd say our most used um, stations are the ones that we've installed at BWI. They get about 10 sessions a day on average. Um, which is great, but then we're also seeing um, a lot of utilization, utilization picking up in areas where we haven't seen as much in the past. Um, some of our lift vehicles that we partnered with through a DOE project are now on the road, and we're seeing a lot of those vehicles charging in communities where likely the EV, the EV drivers are living. Um, so they rent the electric vehicle, and we're seeing those vehicles charge in places like Randallstown, the White Marsh area, Drum Castle, and different um, places that you know they must live nearby. They charge their car and then able to provide the services through Lyft. So we're really glad to see that those vehicles are replacing gas vehicles um, for the zero emissions rides throughout our service territory. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all of you for am I, for answering those questions. Uh, I just have two more hopefully they'll be quick ones um commissioner Layton, if i could uh, I oh i'm like, sorry i see all right that. i'd like to add a little perspective for potomac edison that's exactly what we're doing with our program out in uh, rural western maryland uh really focused on electrifying the corridor out there in places where there are not many ev drivers and it's uh our dc fast chargers out there have been well used and well received so uh, we think we're doing that great thank you thank you so i just wanted to make sure uh I saw in at least uh, two of the uh, utility filings uh, that there was a request to extend uh, the pilot due to supply chain concerns. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that, number one, that all of the companies, uh, there was another suggestion that everybody wanted that request, but I'd only saw it in writing in a couple of filings. So did everybody want that <laughs> extension? Is, was everybody proposing that or was it just some company? Uh, for Smeco's perspective, we did not put it in writing, but we are here to support that. And if you know that latitude is granted to others, we would accept that as well. Um, but we are operating under the assumption that we'll, as today, that we'll we'll have things as close to done by the end of the pilot. But if if so, then we would like that. Yes. Okay. I uh, will. Oh, go ahead. I'd like to say the same for Potomac Edison. We didn't make that request in our filing, and uh, our plans are, as of today, to be fully installed with our 59 chargers by the end of the pilot. For the PHI utilities, we also did not make that request. Um, right. But if you want more information, of course, Brianne can provide more. Okay. Well, would you be similar to the other companies and uh, 
I guess, accepting it if it was offered or if, if the commission determined that it was appropriate? I think so, yes. Okay. All right, so I guess a quick question then along those lines for the uh, commission staff. Uh, is this the right time to make that type of decision to extend for ex several years or uh, is that something that uh, the commission should look at further or is, what would the staff's recommendation be going forward? Um, I, for the other utilities, I think staff would recommend that we wait. Um, so, you know, BGE has, I believe, 600 uh, chargers that a utility owned and operated chargers they were approved to install. So they have quite a bit more than any other utility. I believe it's 500 public and 100 for the multifamily. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so they had quite a bit more than everybody else. Um, prefer I'd like, you know, kind of a wait and see approach. Uh, so we did recommend the BGs be approved because they are quite a bit behind um, because of the supply chain issues. But I believe the other utilities are pretty close to hitting their goals already. So I, personally, I would like more of a wait and see and, you know, try and get things done. Uh, you know, when we all agreed to uh, four years ago. Um, but, you know, we understand that, there, you know, if you can't get transformers, you can't get transformers. It's you know, kind of out of the utility's control. Uh, so personally, I would recommend more of a wait and see for the, for the other utilities. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so my, my colleagues' uh, indulgence, I have one last question uh, regarding, uh, it's actually inspired by Mr. Hartman's experience uh, and moving around and checking a lot of the uh, charges in the BG service territory. Uh, and uh, the information he provided regarding uh, the new law going into effect in October uh, regarding uh, signage for uh, vehicles that are not electric vehicles parking in those spaces. I'm just curious as to what the, co the company's relationships are uh, with the, uh, in the public areas, uh, where places where you've, a char you've installed a charger. Uh, are you able to go back, for example, to encourage them to uh, place signage in, in compliance with the law uh, if that's something that's a challenge in that area. I, again, uh, Christy with BGE, we actually own the, the signage that's installed, so we would be able to replace um, the signage to comply with the law. Uh, in some counties, they do have individual county laws. I think Annapolis, as a city, had passed a specific sign, and in those cases, we have replaced our standard signage, which just says vehicle, uh, electric vehicle charging, only with the uh, signs that are enforceable by either the county or city. Uh, Potomac Edison, uh, we also um, own the signage at our stations, and um, Lanny brought it to our attention earlier in the pilot, what kind of signage we needed to put, it, put up, manual, uniform, traffic control device approved signage. So we've been using those signs uh, from pretty much the beginning of the pilot. Um, I'm not familiar with the law, but if the law requests that the signage follow those standards, we would be in compliance already. Good morning. This is Stephen Park from PHI. Um, we're in the same kind of way. We have our own signs that uh, we are uh, placing with the agreement with the site owners. Now, the law changes, we'll definitely have a discuss dialogue with the, the site owners and see what we need to replace and enforce um, those changes. Thank you. Uh, Lanny Hartman again. I appreciate that question. I. Uh, actually was involved in promoting that law both in Howard County, well, uh, Montgomery County, and at the state level, actually for 10 years. And I appreciate the commission's support. I do know that you wrote a letter in support a few years ago, Matt. And in the uh, case of Annapolis, they did pass a, a city ordinance about two years ago. And I've been trying to in, uh, work with the deputy city manager there to get the signs posted and when I was, and the, um, the sponsor of the bill that passed, uh, chairman of the Environment and Transportation Committee, Kumar Barbe, gave a story about why he uh, sponsored the bills, because his wife would go to the Pitt Moyer Center, where there's a BGE charging station, and try to charge there, and it was always blocked. So I wanted to make sure, I, I promised the, um, the chairman that I would uh, do what I could to if the bill passed to get the signage there and I was there just uh, a week and a half ago and they do not have the enforceable signs hmm. no and and I've and I've gone to uh, speak to the mayor and council uh, about this and so as far as I'm concerned 
uh, about a week and a half ago, it did not have the specific sign. It looks like BG might have a quick response. Chairman and Commissioners, Joe Piccarelli, Senior Engineer for our Utility of the Future Group. Um, we have made swaps in Howard County where they have come up with some new signage, which is enforceable, and we worked with the Howard County government to do that. We're absolutely open to purchasing the signage for Annapolis. Um, we haven't received any direct um, guidance from Annapolis to do that, um, so we had been using this, the standard signs that we'd always installed, but absolutely open to making those swaps. Um, as long as we get some guidance from the city, that, that is what they would like us to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so everyone has answered uh, questions. Uh, I have no further questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Donnell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Beckham, I called you Ms. Taylor earlier. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, so one of your requests since you've used up your full allotment of 750 residential charger rebates is to double that to 1500 uh, since you did the full allotment early and the money went out the door what conclusions has the company drawn with the efficacy and impact of that portion of the portfolio on adoption i mean I've always suspected that EV owners were going to buy these chargers no matter what, and that, that giving money away from the utilities wasn't going to incentivize anything. Yeah. I, just a gut feeling of mine, but tell me what conclusions has the company drawn with that re in regard to that? Yep, well, thank you. Yep, <laughs> let Brianne answer that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the, the Pepco residential charger rebate program uh, has successfully uh, met its cap and with that we have been able to uh, obtain the charger data for the enrollments and that charging data is really critical for the utilities to continue to inform the uh, the charging behaviors of EV drivers and particularly the residential EV drivers that will continue to install residential chargers to pull on the the grid to uh, you know, continue to add capacity on the, the circuits. And so the request that we were making was for a $50 increase, uh, sorry, $50 annual incentive to stay connected with their data from the smart chargers. And that $50 is an incentivization that allows us to stay connected, stay informed, and collect that data on an annual basis. We have seen also that that $50 uh, for uh, customers who have um, been incentivized so far, they have stayed connected to the data at a 100% rate. So we are continuing to see all of the data, all of the necessary data that we can then continue with analytics around our capacity planning and uh, further our customer behavior programs. Um, it's a critical data point for us to continue so with, not just necessarily for the continuation of installation of chargers. So if you have all this good data and the customers are staying on that got these rebates and you're, you're analyzing it, 750 of them out there in the field, why do you need another 750 to do the same analysis? I think that's a fair point. I think that 750 is, um, it is a number that, that was, uh, has an origin, however, 750 more. Uh, the opportunity to continue to pull from a diverse group of, of residential customers is, is an opportunity that I would not pass up. So I don't necessarily have a firm answer as to why what, 750. What's 750 of these re $50 rebates cost? What, what's the math? Uh, 25,000, sorry, I have not. So that's $25,000 of ratepayer money, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, plus carrying charges, you know, it ends up being a lot of money. Someone's paying for it. Low and moderate income people are paying for it. I'm paying for it. I don't have an electric vehicle. These cats do. So I don't. <laughs> it does allow us to to continue to look at the programs that we can, so we can ensure the reliability of those those networks. Not it, w one challenge that we do have is customers coming onto or bringing residential chargers into their homes. 
and we don't necessarily know when they are connecting. Yeah, but I think you have 750 worth of data, and that's probably statistically significant, and it seems like you're just spending money now to send more money out the door, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, at this time, I will propose a number of motions. Uh, just to be clear, the, the discussion with Commissioner Linton regarding this sort of the Me Too for utilities that need additional time, um, they could collectively or indiv individually file a motion for that additional time. We'll, we'll only address the request today from, from BGE. Um, so I would propose to my fellow commissioners that with respect to item number six, um, that we note the filing. With respect to item number seven, that we note the filing and accept the modifications proposed by the PHI companies. With respect to number eight, that we note the filing. And with respect to number nine, that we note the filing and accept the alterations proposed by BG as modified by staff and its comments dated September 2nd, 2022. Vote begins with Commissioner Mr. Lynn. Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner O'Donnell. I'm going to re uh, request that we separate out from your motion the item with the 750 residential rebate customers for uh, Pepco because I'm going to be voting no on that. I'd like to separate it out, make a separate motion. I'll probably be the only no vote. Okay, happy to do that. Um, so what we'll go back to Potomac Edison. Um, I move that we note the filing with respect to item number six. The vote begins with Commissioner Linton. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Richard. Aye. I vote aye. The motion is approved. With respect to item number seven, PHI companies, I move that we note the filing and accept the modifications proposed by the PHI companies. The vote begins with Commissioner Linton. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Did did we separate that out? Yeah. Yes. That's okay. Right. Yeah. I didn't. I wasn't sure when I was supposed to register my no vote. Aye. Yeah. No, no, is this no, no, is no. this the separated one? Yeah. Th th this is item seven, PHI. I didn't, I didn't hear that. My ear didn't hear that. No. <laughs> Commissioner Richard. Uh, I'm going to vote aye, but but I I do take note of uh, Commissioner. Uh, Donald's questions, and I, and I think they're vi very viable. I, I think we need to understand how these smart meters are, are working, um, if they are doing what they're supposed to be doing in this pilot context. Um, but uh, I, am, I am concerned about whether or not more, more money should be spent on the private uh, smart meters. And uh, we'd really like to know what value that is to the program overall and to uh, ratepayers. So with that, I, I do support the motion, but I wanted to make that uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I vote aye. The motion is approved. With respect to the SMECO item, item number eight, I move that we note the filing. The vote begins with Commissioner Linton. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. And Commissioner Richard. Aye. I vote aye. The motion is approved. With respect to item number nine, the BGE filing, I move that we note the filing and accept the alterations proposed by BGE as modified by staff in its comments dated September 2nd, 2022. The vote begins with Commissioner Linton. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. Commissioner Richard. Aye. I vote aye. The motion is approved. Mr. Secretary. Um, Mr. Chairman, we're going to move to item 11 to keep consistent with the discussion here. Um, item number 11 is the PC44 Electric Vehicle Work Group Leader filed its Fleet Subgroup Summary Report, case number 9478. Sorry, Bill. Um, so some people could stay at the table. For others, um, I would invite to the table at this time. This is the electric vehicle work group uh, report and the fleet subgroup summary report. Additionally, if EEI, Montgomery County uh, are here, they may approach a podium. Okay, so I, I, we don't have a staff buck sheet. Um, this is a holdover, holder, holdover item from July 27th, an administrative meeting which I was not present. Um, but work group leader Amanda Best presented her June 30th report. Um, since then, we've received some responsive pleadings to commissioner questions from the Exelon Utilities, um, a very thorough response, I might add. Uh, Montgomery County and Edison Electric Institute filed comments in support of this consensus proposal, and Mr. Hoover of OPC filed comments in not opposition to the proposal. Um, if there are no updates, if there are updates, raise your hand from the July 27th meeting. I'll turn to my colleagues if they have questions. Commissioner O'Donnell. 
for, for the joint Exelon utilities, um, we had a series of questions and you responded and, and it's appreciated in your response. Um, but on the third page of the filing, the response of filing to those questions, um, Number three, what is the fleet size of the vehicles based on? And when I read this thing, the, the answer was the minimum size is based on the commission's definition provided in order 90036, parentheses, and then it's all caps. Order approving import modifications to the state electric vehicle charging pilot program. That feels like a hollering in a text message. <laughs> is that just a cut and paste job or why is that all capitalized? It just felt like to me, it's your own order. Commissioner O'Donnell, I do believe that probably is a typo. I don't think that we were meaning to yell at you. <laughs> I had I, I kind of knew better because I know you wouldn't do that, but I had to ask that. It was an attempt to provide a site for the commission to review the order and have a direct um, ability to look at the yeah. actual language. I'm rem I reminded of a lyric out of a Kansas, I think it was Kansas, Dust in the Wind song. So. Something to the effect of, if, if I ever claim to be a wise man, it surely means that I don't know, right? So I had a fellow tell us how sophisticated he was last week. Same, same principle, right? Okay. <laughs> but um, do you know if that definition we put in that previous order, because I don't know, was um, tagged to the same owner or same entity? In other words, you couldn't have five people get together and form a fleet. I think I would have to, I'd have to check and get back to you. Um, oh, I thought I saw Mr. Hartman coming up. I'll check and get back to you, Mr. O'Donnell. I can, I can answer the, the question for, for the Exelon Utilities. It would be one customer having five vehicles, at, okay. you know, at least five vehicles. And we have the stipulation also in, in the proposal that uh, one customer cannot participate more than twice. So that was a proposal from staff in the work group process that, you know, if you had a large customer that had different locations that they couldn't, you know, take up all the rebates so one customer had two locations or ten locations they would be able to participate more than once but um, only twice for that customer and each has to have at least at least five vehicles okay so that is that in our order or is that per your policy that is um, a, a compromise that we came to in the work group process okay is it memorialized somewhere right. yes it's in the in the filing in the file okay yes. fair enough thank you appreciate it Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any additional questions? Seeing none, um, I would just like to thank all the, the parties who work collaboratively, um, reaching a consensus proposal on, uh, on this rather complex topic. I recognize that we only approved the online tool last year, and uh, you've worked a long way towards getting to consensus or non-opposition, which is equally as uh, productive. So I would move that we approve the consensus fleet proposals of the Exelon Utilities uh, as filed and reflected in Appendix B of the Fleet Subgroup Summary Report dated June 30th, 2022. The vote begins with Commissioner Linton. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. Aye. And Commissioner Richard. Aye. I vote aye. The motion is approved. Thank you all. Uh, the final item, Mr. Secretary. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, it's item number 10. It's for Front Power LLC. FFP Maryland, the Freeland Project 1 LLC filed its request for an operational deadline extension for the Middletown Road Community Solar Energy Generating System. Ms. Garofalo elbowing her way to the podium as the, the masses depart. Yes, it's going to get less crowded in a moment. Uh, um, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Annette Garofalo on behalf of Commission staff. Um, Forefront Power LLC with its subsidiary FFP Maryland Freeland Project LLC is seeking a waiver of Comar 20 620304C in order that the operational deadline for the Middletown Road Community Solar Generating Station may be extended from September 15th, 2022 to December 15th, 2022. Middleton Road represents approximately two megawatts of generating capacity in the open category in the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company Service Territory. Middleton Road is a year one solar project with a storied history, having been subject to a legal challenge, a sale, a change in regulations governing the operation, operating deadline, 
and at least one deadline extension due to permitting delays. As mentioned, its current um, operating deadline is September 15th, 2022. This waiver is requested to accommodate supply chain disruptions for a specific part. Um, that circumstance appears to be outside applicants' control, and staff recommends the requested waiver be granted for good cause shown. Thank you, Ms. Garofalo. Counsel for the applicant. And good morning, Chairman Commissioners. Eric Wallace with the law firm Green Herlocker on behalf of Forefront Power LLC and FFPMD Freeland one, uh, Project 1 LLC, the project entity for this facility. Uh, I'm joined by Christian Schlesinger, the project manager from Forefront. Uh, we want to uh, start by uh, thanking staff for their review and the recommendation on this matter. Um, the project is under construction. The piles have been uh, installed and the racking is, is being installed. The modules will be delivered next week. Um, and so the, the component that drove the supply chain delay was the switch gear, uh, which is scheduled to be uh, delivered in the next few weeks. And, and that will be installed while they're finishing the module installation. Um, and so the project continues to, to follow a timeline and that will uh, where we'll reach commercial operation within the uh, December 15th uh, extension that we're requesting with this filing. And we just ask that the commission approve the uh, request as, as filed. Thank you. Uh, so your deadline's tomorrow. It expires tomorrow. Yes, sir. Okay. We, we, we appreciate staff's uh, <laughs> effort to expedite this to, to get us in um, here under the wire. Yeah, I, I know you requested uh, last week's uh, AM. So the modules are on the trucks there. They're en route or will be soon? They're being delivered in the next week or two, um, next week. So they, they're ordered, they're manufactured, and they're, they're ready to be delivered. And you're confident that you'll be ready to go with no additional extensions by December 15th? Yes. Okay. Um, my colleagues, Commissioner O'Donnell. I was talking to the chairman uh, earlier this morning about an unrelated matter. And, uh, you know, I, I had a rhetorical question. I said, what? Why do we set performance standards and orders and deadlines if we then relieve people and waive them from people's responsibility? So you'll you'll see a continuous thread. Ms. Garofalo knows this. I'm pretty much a stickler on these kind of extensions and, and questioning them, not just you. When when uh, Mr. Wallace was the switchgear ordered? It was, it was early in the year. Early in 2022? Yes. This project's been on, on the board since 2017. And here we are after extension, after extension, after extension, after extension, requesting another extension because you just ordered in, in a year, in the year that we knew we had supply chain issues. At Christmas time, we saw all the ships sitting out in the harbors. So, um, Typically, we don't engage with an EPT, EPC, uh, which is the contractor who would uh, complete the electrical design work and then procure all the electrical components until after we have all the discretionary permitting completed with the county. So, um, you know, there were some delays, as uh, was mentioned earlier, in the approval process with the county. Um, once we did receive and had a green light to go forward with um, engaging with an EPC to start the uh, electrical design, which is required for building permits, um, then we were able to, you know, have them place the order and procure the necessary equipment. Which so when did you get those? Out. When did you get those permits? The building permit was issued um, approximately three three months ago. We've been under construction for two months. We're about fifty percent uh, complete in construction. The manufacturer, Eaton, uh, who is manufacturing the switchgear, has realized uh, delays in um, their supply chain. We have a letter, uh, I believe, um, that was submitted yeah, from Eaton. We're, we're, we're um, aware of and, and know about the switchgear issues mm -hmm. and the supply chain issues. And we've seen it manifest itself mm -hmm. in other projects and other pilots. So we're, we're well aware of that. Sure. But I just... <laughs> five years down the road I'm still not there and I, I just that bugs me 
due to my previously stated general dislike of these matters. Why set a deadline if it doesn't mean anything? Why set a standard if it performance can be waived automatically just when you ask? That's just my thought. I'm not speaking for this commission. I'm speaking for myself as a commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any additional questions? Commissioner Linton. Oh, I'm sorry. No questions. Oh, no questions. I didn't see your face. I saw your finger. Um, uh, I would uh, move that we grant the company's request for a time-limited waiver of the operational deadline applicable to the Middletown Road Community Solar Generating Station to December 15th, 2022. The vote begins with Commissioner Linton. Aye. Commissioner O'Donnell. I'm going to vote no and explain my vote, Mr. Chairman. My no vote is symbolic because we got way too many of these coming through. Commissioner Richard. Aye. I vote aye. The motion is approved. With no additional matters on today's meeting, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.